Hello and welcome to the Everything Is Black and White podcast. It's time for the match preview with myself, Andrew Musgrove, and John Gibson. Newcastle travel to face Crystal Palace on Wednesday evening in another important game of Newcastle United article in European football for next season. John, welcome back to the podcast. How are you keeping you well? I'm good. I'm fine. And uh, as I always say when we haven't had a game, delighted to get back to playing football because it seems to be twice as long, doesn't it? When we had in the game this weekend, you know, horrendous. But uh, here we go again, two in a couple of days. That's great. Yeah, looking forward to the game. We, of course, did bring you guys an episode last week, despite Newcastle not having the game. And it was the ultimate Newcastle United dinner party guest list. I'm glad to say it's been really well received. Me and John enjoyed doing it. If you haven't watched or listened to it yet, just scroll back down your podcast feed and you'll find it there. Let us know what you think about our guests. Off the top of my head, who was it, John? It was Alan Shearer, of course. It was yeah. Kath, the tea lady. We had yes. Joe Harvey, Terry Hibbert, Colin Veach, and remind me of the, the last one. Was that all of them? Uh, no, it was... Uh, was and it Stan Seymour Jr. Stan Seymour Senior. <laughs> the old man that won the cup in 24 and the league in 27 and become Mr. Newcastle United. Yeah, what a guest list. Uh, so go back and listen to it if you haven't already. I'm sure you will enjoy it. But yes, we're going to focus today on Crystal Palace down at Selhurst Park. And John, the first thing that always springs to my mind when I say Selhurst Park is this kind of fortress. You always think of Crystal Palace's home form being the, the important element to their season. But They've lost quite a few games there this season. Is it as dangerous a place to go as maybe we all believe in our heads, do you think? No, I, I think it possibly isn't. I mean, um, they have had a change of manager. Roy Hodgson's gone. Things have changed very much. And everybody's coming up to me and saying, oh, dear me, you know, the, the Chris, just as we're going down, Crystal Palace have got this great form. Yeah, they're on a winning run of two matches. They're only on a winning run of two matches, so not, let's not get carried away. There were two terrific results. They went to Liverpool and won 1-0. And, of course, they beat uh, West Ham at the weekend 5-2. But I tell you what, we won't surrender the way West Ham surrendered. That is the, the biggest certainty of the lot because they had the, the white flag up after about five minutes, West Ham. Um, it, no, it's not... You know, it's easy to get apprehensive or whatever because we care so much and the results are so important at this stage of the season but let's keep a sense of proportion Newcastle are a better team than Crystal Palace and if you don't believe that look at the table and um, because it, that tells you so and um, that doesn't mean Newcastle don't win on the Wednesday night if they don't go with the right attitude and and um, Palace have on such an up after what they did in the last home game, but they've got nothing at stake. There's, you know, we've got a lot at stake, so let's make it count. Yeah, I think the win for them over West Ham pretty much secures their yeah their Premier League status for the next season. I think uh, the, the last two weeks, the last two wins does that for them, whereas they were maybe looking a little bit over their shoulder. But I guess now the fact that they've got nothing to play for, they have got a lot of players out of contract, so maybe they want to put themselves. Sure. In the shop window, if they're going to leave Palace or in the, the manager's mind as he looks to plan his future and his future team at Sellers Park. But the fact that they are safe, John, now might play into Newcastle's hands. You know, yeah, I, I think the one danger we have, uh, Andrew, from my point of view, is that uh, Ezra and uh, Ulisi are terrific. They are, they've only been together half a dozen times this season, actually in tandem. One of the other has been injured. They are huge and they are so talented. You saw them against West Ham. I mean, I'd be surprised if either of them are at Palace next season. I think there's yeah. going to be a lot of big clubs come a calling. Um, <clears throat> but they've got natural ability and they will torment our back four. Uh, there's a need to keep a, a real hold on them. Ironically, you can actually talk about the match being about the, the two front threes because them two with their, their centre forward and us with uh, Isaac and Barnes and Gordon, it's a shootout at OK Corral. The, mm. It's the three against the three, the best the team comes out. Um, so it's going to be interesting. 
Yeah, it certainly is. And we'll talk about uh, the main battles on the pitch in a moment because you have mentioned Eze and the least there. And there's going to be some key selection choices for Eddie Howe to stop those two. But just a quick run through some stats. Newcastle have picked up 18 points from available 30. They've only lost two in the last 10, so they're finding form at just the right time. Palace have picked up 12 points from the last 10 and, uh, as we say, have won the last two one against Liverpool away and that game against West Ham. Looking at Newcastle's team, John, not likely to see Joe Linton or Nick Pope or Kieran Trippier. They haven't trained with the group. They are back in training but haven't trained with the group. So they're not going to be up for selection. We've had the news, Joe Willick and Lewis Miley out for the season as well. I'll get your, your point, your viewpoint on that in a moment. But in terms of the start in 11, John... Mm. The big question is for me probably the the back line and what does Eddie Howe do? Does he yeah. move Dan Byrne back into centre back and and bring Lewis Hall on at left back because that's going to be the key, isn't it? As a yeah, and the least... I mean they really they really played a three against uh, Spurs and marked yeah. up man for man, didn't they? Rather than Byrne plays an orthodox left back, he sort of played in between the centre half and the left back part of the pitch uh, in a three um, and he probably won't go with a three this time and um, what he does and by the way it was a master class what he did against Spurs it was terrific and that result was so heartening in the way the front three played in the way Bruno played and Anderson played and the way we got round our problems at the back using Murphy as a spare man I mean Murphy played three roles he played right back uh, right um, side midfield in an outside right his proper position and um, I don't think that experiment will go again when you look at it the only changes that can be made are really in the back four because Wilson's not going to start he's been out for so long he's going to be the bench and by the way how do you start him with the way the three boys up front played in the last game Gordon Isaac and Bonds were sensational against Spurs they've got to go again so Wilson's on the bench. The only thing you can do if you go to an orthodox back four, which is what Eddie prefers, you've got the situation where you can bring Livermento in and Hall in, who were only fit enough for the bench against um, Spurs. But after a week and a half's further training, etc., no doubt come into consideration to be in the team. Um, Watch centre centre halves. You're going to go with um, Sean Byrne, I would suspect, and then do you go Levermento right back and Hall left back? Certainly, Levermento for me has got to be in the team, whether he's in at right back or left back. Whether you play Craft at right back and Levermento at left back, or you play Levermento at right back and and Hall on the other side, <clears throat> but Levermento has got to be brought back in the side. His quality. Um, uh, he can play either side equally well. He can defend and he goes forward looking like a Rolls Royce. So he's got to play. Hmm. I think if Livermento and Hall are fit and available, then I would play them back in the back four. Livermento right back, Hall left back with Byrne coming into the centre uh, alongside Shep. It'd be interesting to see how Hall defends <laughs> against these two top lads that we've just been talking about. Yeah. As a in Elisa, because um, they're they are clever, and and you feel Levermento can handle it. Can Hall handle it? I hope so. Um, his his future is definitely here now because the deal's a done deal. And um, and as Eddie himself said, what he had to learn when he came to Newcastle was not just the high pressing and the physical demands, but defensively. He wasn't quite at the races. I don't think he is yet, but I think he's getting there. This would be a real test of him defensively. Um, but hey, he's worth £28 million. Pound. So, um, you know, he's got to face this. He's in the Premier League. Yeah, and these are the, the tests and challenges you want because you go up against the best players, you become a better player yourself. I I would go four at the back, but it is interesting that when we look back on that Spurs game... And I've spoken to a Crystal Palace podcaster for The View from the Opposition, and that'll go out on Wednesday morning. 
And he told me that Palace like to pass the ball around a bit. They like to have possession of it. And I do wonder whether actually we maybe see a similar setup to Spurs where Newcastle do back off when needed. They do man mark and they say to Palace, right, here's the ball, come on to us and we'll show you what you, what what we can do when we stop you and hit you on the counter. Because if Palace want to pass it around, they want to pass it out of defence, Newcastle can press them high, force them into mistakes. And if Palace are fortunate enough to get it in Newcastle's half, then yeah, Elliot Anderson drops back to left wing back, Jacob Murphy back to right wing back, three across the middle, and we'll stop Elise, we'll stop Eze from creating any danger, we'll stop Mateta. It could work, John. Again, they did so well against Spurs, and it sounds like Palace will play or try to play in a similar way to Spurs. Yeah, yeah, it could work again, and he could go down that road. Uh, whether you would want voluntarily, because bear in mind, it was a master class of using tactics and not playing a flat back four, but marking up man for man, uh, which is what they did, and leaving uh, Murphy as the spare man. You, I would worry a tad with Murphy in that position, uh, you know, with, with Ezra going down there. I would worry a tad about him defensively being turned inside out. Perhaps Livermento could do that because he's better defensively than Murphy, who, who's a winger, and Livermento still gives you something going forward, which Kraft wouldn't. So whether Livermento could do the Murphy job would be interesting. It'll be very, very interesting to see if he... I was almost going to say if he dares go with the tactics against Spurs, because they were very unusual. They were a master class for the way Spurs play, going man to man on song and... and Johnson just didn't seem to want to know. I, I can't imagine Palace being exactly the same. Uh, but it was very, very interesting. There you go, that, that formation again, when you can start with Livermento and all, would you go with Murphy in that wall? Um, maybe you would. Or maybe you would go three at the back and change Livermento for Murphy. It's difficult, isn't it? Because obviously you'll, you'll send your scouts, you'll do your homework, you'll... You know, you'll do your scouting reports, but this Crystal Palace team is still evolving. He hasn't been in the job, Glasnow, all that long. So, you know, if you've watched him three or four weeks ago, things might be very different to what you see. Oh, totally. Last week or the week before against Liverpool. So it's hard to nail down exactly how they play. And of course, Eddie Howe will be thinking about how his team can hurt the opposition, not how the opposition can hurt his team. But, you know, speaking to that Palace podcaster, he's 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 very adamant that it will be a, a passing game. So, you know, Newcastle, at the very least, you would imagine, will be pressing high and trying to force them into mistakes. We'll go into the midfield, John. You imagine, you know, whatever formation he plays, it'll have to be the, the, the three that started against Tottenham, Bruno, Longstaff and Elliot Arneson. Let's start with Elliot Arneson because I've said many times on this podcast, one of my biggest regrets about this season, one of the, the biggest what-if moments is about Elliot Anderson. What if he hadn't picked up that injury and he was out for all that time? Because it's been a big, big loss. He would have had an opportunity to really shine. We're starting to see it now. It's just a massive regret of mine that he's not been able to do that from the word go. But hey, he's here now. Brilliant against Tottenham. Can he do it again against Palace? Of course he can. He's, he's quality. The kid's going to be big. Um I think there's no question about that. He went under the radar because everything that he promised pre-season couldn't come to fulfilment. And ironically, from his point of view, a kid that's even younger in him, Lewis Miley, then goes into midfield because Elliot's not available and starts getting all the, the headlines, as you would as a 17-year-old, with his sort of ability. But to be truthful... Uh, at this moment in development, I think Elliot Anderson is one step further on than Lewis Miley because of age and because of experience, and that's nothing to that's not having to go at Lewis under any circumstances. But he's in his development, he's one step further on. He's got an all round game. He can pass. He's a visionary. He's got movement. He sticks his foot in, which is terrific. He's got every. He ticks virtually every box. He thoroughly deserves to be in the side alongside Bruno. And Bruno's suddenly getting some help, not just in the physicality of the midfield game, because, as I say, Anderson puts his foot in, but in the, in the, the visionary side of it. And I think um, 
Sean looked a better player for that in that three against Spurs. And the performance of those three in midfield and the performance of the three up front, they've demanded they're played again. If you wondered what happens with people like Anderson, what happens with Harvey Barnes, who hasn't been in the side, and what happens Gordon playing on his supposed wrong side, the right, but he can play right and left equally well. But they answered those questions. You don't take Harvey Barnes out the team the way Harvey Barnes played. You don't take Anderson out the team the way Anderson played. They were, were the two guys given the opportunity in the middle and the, the front, and they demanded that they stay in the side, and will as a consequence. Yeah, indeed. And we'll talk there about Bruno. Thankfully, he got through that run of games he needed to to avoid a two-game ban. Eddie Howe was asked about it in today's press conference and said Bruno is always setting new goals for himself. Very motivated to help the team. His form has been very good and his yellow card situation refocused his game. It was a healthy thing. He made a difference versus Tottenham alongside Sean, which is what you just said there. Uh, hopefully, Bruno can continue on the path he's been on because Eddie Howe is, is right. It was a healthy thing. We've said before, John, he looked much more focused. He looked disciplined because he had to and now it's going to be a really interesting first game I mean, without that hanging over him what kind of Bruno are we going to see is he going to go back to the old Bruno and a little bit uh ill-disciplined perhaps or do you think he'll well, manage I, to keep the I mean I, I'm I am confused why he, he was the old Bruno I mean you you look at Anthony Gordon who runs um foul of if, if yellows and it happens with a little bit of petulance or kicking the ball away or whatever, clumsy fouls. He hasn't sort of righted that wrong because when he had the ban hanging over him, he got two yellows in one game and got a one-match suspension. So he served something. But with Bruno, I look at it and I mean, this is a compliment. What on earth was he doing getting all those bookings to start with? When he can be so disciplined, why not be disciplined? Because it didn't take... One iota out of his game. He didn't become tame because somebody had taken the blood and thunder out of him by the bookings. He became a disciplined aggressor, but he still stayed an aggressor, but he wasn't stupid. Now, if he can do that for that huge length of time, what was it, January or something all the way through? If he can do that, let's do it all season, my son. You'll do yourself a favour, you'll do us a favour, you'll do the team a favour. You know, and um, that is all meant as a, a compliment. Well done, the lad, not a criticism. We've found that he has got that discipline inside of him. You know, if you score a goal, don't take your shirt off. Um, I, I, that's the simple one, but it, it's a wild pass. It's a wild losing the ball and you can see the thunder. A decision goes against him. You almost, in the old days, you almost knew within 30 seconds he was going to foul somebody because he was that furious with himself, with the ref and with everything else. He went, boom. Now, this is the new Bruno. Well, let it become the normal Bruno because he's much better for us and for himself. And he handled himself magnificently during that period. And as I say, it didn't give... I mean, he was carrying the midfield during that period and doing it brilliantly well. Anderson's a huge help there. Um, in coming into the side, I really do believe that because when it was Willock and, and, and Longstaff, etc., after Joe went out, you know, he was on his own. Uh, Anderson's, he doesn't give us what Joe Linton gives us because he's not as physical as Joe, but he's getting that way. He gives us more in physicality than, say, Willock would, for example, or Lewis Miley would, for example. Um, so he has been a plus in there and well done Bruno but let that be um, you know the way we see him next season and by the way Bruno I'm absolutely delighted about your new housemate and um, no doubt you are and we all are because um, if you're going to buy a £4 million mansion I don't think you're going to leave it three months later to go somewhere else so that is a huge indicator that uh, he's as happy as Larry and um who was permanently happy, our Larry. And, uh, of course, it's simultaneously, and I'm not suggesting this is the reason why, but Big Joe decided to stay. So the, uh, the Blues brothers are together, and that's terrific for Newcastle United because they're two of our top players with Anthony Gordon, etc. So um, I hope you have a nice 
housewarming, my son, and keep looking at how lovely the house is and what a terrific garden you've got, and you don't give that away too easily. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for those who aren't sure what John's referencing, his story in the Telegraph earlier in the week, which uh, claimed Bruno has just spent £4 million on a house up in Dowers Hall, and that is reason to believe he's not going to go anywhere anytime soon, which is brilliant news. I just want to get your viewpoint, John, on something... Danny Murphy said on Bruno Gimrush. Have you seen this, John? What did he say? Oh, you haven't seen it all. Oh, well, it's a good job you're sitting down. Danny Murphy, obviously ex-Liverpool, Fulham midfielder, talking on Talk Sport, said right. this about Bruno. Uh, he's not uh, that, and then in brackets, not being a good athlete is what will stop him from being one of the best because everything else in his game is superb. Great passer, technically gifted, but he's not a great athlete. He needs real athletes around him to shine. Normally, they've got that with Joe Linton, Willick and Longstaff. They surround him with amazing legs, so you see the best of him. To be fair to Bruno, his durability in terms of always being available is impressive. He always turns up. His athleticism is only a problem when he doesn't have those around him to help him. He's still a crucial player for them, but if you're talking about the best midfielders in the world, that's what will stop him being classed as one of them. What on earth is Danny Murphy talking about? Because the one thing, John, that I've never, ever doubted about Bruno's game is his athleticism. He's absolutely got the legs and engine about him. I don't know what Murphy's talking about. Well, I mean, really, as well, when you have class, class players, there's always some minus you can put your finger on if you wish to do that. You know, you could say... If only Alan Shearer um, had the pace of Joe Gloves. If only Bobby Moore hadn't been one pace in, in defence. Did it stop either of those being world-class, by the way? You know, forget... I mean, Shearer was a world-class centre-forward. Just look at his goals, if you, if you if you want to see that. Bobby Moore was the ultimate Mr. Cool defender who read the game and was two steps ahead of everybody else. He weren't blessed by pace. And if you want theoretically a A1 type of player in that position, then you give him pace, you give him head and ability, you give him this, give him that. Has everybody got everything? Stanley Matthews become the first player ever to be knighted in football. Couldn't score goals, but it didn't seem to hold him back, did it? You, you, you know, it's a, it's there's always something you can say. And I take your point. I don't think that Bruno lacks athleticism. I mean, you should have seen the old days, bless them, when when you had uh, Tommy Cassidy and Tommy Craig at Newcastle. Wonderful, wonderful ball players, but almost stationary, bless them, because of their lack of pace. Jean Mulby was exactly like that at Liverpool. There were still tremendous players. It is nitpicking. I mean, I'm like you. I don't think it's actually true in this guy's uh, case, but it's it's nitpicking to to sort of go down that road. You know, yes, if you could have put Jackie Milburn or Supermax pace on Shearer, what might he become? But did he not do well enough anyway? I suspect that he did, in both for England and for Newcastle United, and the same with Bobby Moore, bless him. Um, it's a nonsense. We'll settle for imperfect players as long as they play for Newcastle in there. You know, we can have Bruno, you can have Joe Linton and say that he doesn't do this, that or the other. You can look at Anthony Gordon and say he's not disciplined. And I'll settle for all those minuses as long as they have their pluses. Yeah, they're not doing too badly. And I think it just speaks to someone who doesn't watch Newcastle week in, week out because to make those comments about Bruno... Just unbelievable, but uh, there you go. Moving up top, John, three. I mean, there's no question about it. The three up top will remain uh, Harvey Barnes, oh, Anthony Gordon. and, and dear, oh dear. Absolutely. I mean, we, we've always had two up top, haven't we? You know, we, we, we've had Isaac and Gordon and then who plays on the right wing? Is it Murphy or is it Almiron or whatever? Or we've had Wilson with Isaac out left uh, whatever whatever but we've always had two good front men out of three and that is because Barnes hasn't been available for nine tenths of the season because of injuries I mean he was like Lord Lucan you couldn't find him but all of a sudden here he is and we see what we've got and I thought the three of them and of course 
Spurs were suicidal. You play a high line against those three, their ability on the ball, their quickness to get in behind you, and people like Bruno and Fabian Shaw with their ability to drop a ball on a tanner from distance. You, I mean, you're asking for trouble. They just hit the green grass behind their back four and let our guys run. And they were terrific. And you know what's lovely about three of them? They can all finish. They're not just about assists. I mean, obviously, he's acting finish. He's got 21. But they all do well on assists. But Barnes and Gordon aren't just about assists as wide players. Gordon's discovered goals this season, which he never had at Everton. Barnes has always been about goals. That, that is his big plus as a wide player, is that he comes in on that foot and puts it in the far top corner. We've got three guys who threaten teams here. We've got three guys with pace and three guys that you're not going to bully out of the game because they won't be bullied. And the secret is to keep them fit because Gordon, bless him, I mean, how wide is he? He's only, he's only missed two games and it's been through suspension both times. Barnes, we've already seen. Isaac had injury problems earlier this season. We've got to keep Isaac and Barnes fit next season and, and with Gordon as well and back up because you always need backup off the bench. And, um, you know, it looks very healthy up there all of a sudden. It certainly does. And three wonderful players and they can replicate what they brought to the pitch against Tottenham. The Newcastle will be in for a very good performance and result against Crystal Palace. I think looking at the Palace back line, the, 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 they've played three at the back or they did against West Ham and maybe uh, Klein is potentially the weak spot. John he goes up against Isaac. He might be uh, slightly embarrassed. That's maybe somewhere to target. You've mentioned uh, the bench as well. And you've spoken about Callum Wilson. Um, big boost to have him as an option to come off on the hour mark or, or whenever he's called upon. Oh, I mean, uh, the bench has been our weakness recently, but it hardly looks as if it is a weakness because we've taken 10 points out the last 12. But you've looked at the bench and there's more kids on it than there is in the local kindergarten because it, it's it, it, that's the way it's been. Um, but all of a sudden, if... If Hall and Livermento go back in the side, some say Murphy and Kraft drop out, they're experienced players on the bench. Wilson will be on the bench, which is terrific. The bench is suddenly getting better. It's nowhere near what we want it to be because you're still going to have a few kids on there, inexperienced kids. But there's some wiggle room on the bench and having Wilson to, to come on later on <clears throat> is a massive plus because we're talking about playing two games in about four days, three days, because we've got Sheffield United up here on Saturday. So you're wanting to, if the result's going the right way, you're wanting to stick Wilson on and bring Isaac off after some time after the hour mark because you've got Sheffield United to come. Um, so, you know, it, it's all a help because... It's quite incredible to think we've got 10 points out of the last 12 because if you've looked at the bench, we have had a start in 11 and that's been it, Andrew. That's been it because we've had two goalkeepers. We've had people that, with respect, are nowhere near the first team starting 11, like Richie and Dummett. And, and, and we've had a load of kids and that's been our bench. Now, that's frightening. And yet we're still taking 10 points out of the last 12 which is colossal. We are six top going into this set of games this midweek. We're six top. That will be good enough to guarantee us uh, being in Europe next season if we keep the six top position. We also smash the super six, self-appointed super six, I hasten to add, which absolutely irritates me. We smash them because if we finish sixth, it means Manchester United and Chelsea are beneath us because the top three are away and the fourth Champions League position is between Aston Villa and Spurs. So that takes us to five and then we are on six. So if we make six, we make Europe and Manchester United and Chelsea finish below us. And aren't we pleased about that? Chelsea with all that cash, all that scattergun being not working and Manchester United always sick to death of those. In, when the entertainers were carrying our hopes, 
we finished runner-up twice in the Premier League to Manchester United in the Carabao Cup last year. Look at the way they made their FA Cup final this year. I mean, we got the game won in the last minute of extra time and the guy forgot to cut his toenails and therefore he was offside. Um, I mean, they are such a lucky, lucky team. To finish above them would be, as Kevin Keegan used to say, I love it, I love it. And um, we can stay six. If you look at the games we've got left, yes, you can make a case out of Palace on a little run. You've got to go to Manchester United. You can always say Brighton have got a chance of doing pretty well, etc., etc. So what? There's no massive hitters in that fixture list and we can hang on to the sixth place we've got. It's going to be difficult to get any higher. I, I really do believe that. But I mean, sixth will put us into Europe and sixth will put us above Manchester United and Chelsea, the way sh things are shaping up. It would be a tremendous achievement to get European football, given everything that's gone on this season. I did a video last week, John, where I predicted the final league table. There's a, a widget on our website where you can put in all the results and it'll give you the end of season table. I had Newcastle finish in sixth. I think it was eight points ahead of my United in seventh. So fingers crossed that does become a reality. And, you know, we're recording this on Tuesday. Chelsea play Arsenal tonight and there's been a lot of chat not really in the northeast, but a little bit down in the big smoke about Chelsea, the ones to watch. I don't buy that at all. I think they'll get beat tonight off Arsenal. I think that'll be the end of their chances of finishing sixth. My night to play Sheffield United at the same time Newcastle play Palace. I mean, <laughs> on paper, you'd say that's a shoe in for my United, but the way they've been playing, you know, Sheffield United, the one thing they have got is a bit of fight. I mean, they are awful. Hopefully, I don't jinx Saturday by saying that, but they are awful. But they have got a bit of fight. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, John, are they at home tonight, potentially? I'll double-check that. But No, I think it's it, man. You... Is it mine? I I think... believe... But do you but... know what, John? Even that's maybe not a good thing for Manchester United because of the way they got into the final, as you mentioned, things aren't feeling good. I mean, Chris Sutton's already said on the BBC this week that it's the end of Ten Hag. There's no coming back from it. And he's in a cup final. So, you know, Sheffield United, nothing to lose. Everyone's expecting them to go down. They get to Old Trafford. Why not? Why can't they get a result? Well, because they're hopeless. They're the most hopeless team in the country. That's why they can't get a result. I mean, honestly, I think Gateshead would turn Sheffield United over. Um, but I'm biased. Uh, but, yeah, they are awful. And I'm tempting fate with Saturday rapidly coming up. But no, I'm not. I mean, look at Sheffield United. The bottom of the league, they've let in the most goals and they've scored the least goals. And we won eight and out at their place. I mean, honestly, they're, they're hopeless. Um, but that's for another day. I think West Ham getting beat by Crystal Palace finished West Ham. Yeah. They, they have now played two. They would have gone above us. Thank you, Crystal Palace, for doing us a favour by beating West Ham, who would have gone above us with three points. By the way, if you're expecting us to do you a favour by giving you three points tomorrow night, forget it. Geordies aren't that stupid uh, But we're thankful for what you did West Ham are now beneath us By a couple of points Have played two games more Than this away Moses is going to get the, the pedal in the summer etc. They've gone If you look at the Chelsea fixture list It's tough They've got this Arsenal game They've got other top, top games coming Manchester United, I think, have got it off the top of my head. They haven't got them in front of me, but they've got Sheffield United. I think they've got Burnley. They've got a couple of easy ones where they can get the nose in front, but then their run-in's poor. And their run-in includes playing us. So I think we can hold them off. Um, of course, there's going to be a challenge. Somebody's going to come out the woodwork and get a result that uh, is unexpected. But um, I think we can comfortably hold on to this position. And, you know, if we if we win tomorrow night, we've got Sheffield United at home and Burnley away in the next couple of games. You know, you can really be cooking on gas at the end of that. And the way we played against Spurs, I mean, we on West Ham, they rolled over and had their tummy tickled. We aren't going to do that tomorrow night. Crystal Palace can forget any thought of that tomorrow night.
Yeah, I and mean, that's the key, isn't it? It's, it's about Newcastle beating Palace and not worrying about what happens elsewhere. Because if Newcastle win, that's what matters and they'll stay above Manchester United um, unless they win 16 or 17 nil against Sheffield I mean, United, which I don't think is going to happen. One of the things, I know you're a big Joe Harvey fan and I was privileged to know and work with Joe for so long. And one of the things, Joe, who wasn't a coach or a tactician, he got a coach to do that. He was a man manager. He was shrewd. He could see good talent. And whenever we played somebody when we were winning the first cup, the season we, we went all over the continent, beat every single per team and won the cup. He used to say to me, Gibbo, and he used to say to the players, never mind about the opposition. Let them worry about us. We could worry. And, and Supermark has said to me since, it was the exact opposite when Malcolm McDonald was playing for England with Don Revy. He worried so much about the opposition and give them a dossier which would choke a horse on the opposition that if you read it, you were terrified to go out on the uh, on the Wednesday night to play for England because the opposition were all supermen. Um, Joe Harvey, while not dismissive of the opposition, would say, listen, let them worry about us. And that's my attitude as I go into Crystal Palace. Yes, they've won at Liverpool, and yes, they've just beaten West Ham, and yes, they're on a great winning run of two games. Let them worry about us. Uh, you know, maybe they, they have got is a uh, new Lisa, but we have Gordon, Isaac, and Barnes. Let them worry about us, because if we hit our game, are you telling me that Crystal Palace are a better side than Spurs? If so, they should be fourth top. Um, and we took, we dismantled Spurs. So why shouldn't we win tomorrow night? No, one hundred percent agree with you. Uh, I'm, I'm. Looking forward to the game. I think it's definitely going to be goals, and that's definitely the right mentality to take into the game. Uh, anyhow, has spoken about the little bit of a, a break that the players have had. Obviously, they beat Spurs, didn't play over the weekend just gone, and then coming to this game. So they have had a little bit of a rest. He said the players had a couple of days off. We've tried to use the time productively. The lads are feeling good about themselves. We don't want to lose our rhythm. We have tried to keep everything the same. We have tried to make sure we are physically where we need to be when the game kicks off. And I guess that's the one downside to maybe having the break, John. You would have wanted the game against Manchester United to actually have been played at the weekend just gone because they definitely would have beaten them. They would have still been riding that uh, wave of optimism and positivity after beating Spurs. I guess, though, you could also argue, look, it's just an extra couple of days. It's not like it's a two-week break. The next couple no. of days, the players no. can refresh, and it was such a good performance and victory against Spurs that you know a little bit of the adrenaline still should be there because it was it was that good. And and, and it should kick in when we play Sheffield United, Andrew, because we we live only yes we're playing them three days after Crystal Palace, but we had such a rest before that we should be up and and really at at it. On Saturday, whereas if you played Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, you might just be a bit leggy on the Saturday. Um, so we should get a benefit there along the road. Um, but this, the most important game is always the next one because you, you, when, when it comes down to this stage of the season, you need three points at every opportunity. But I mean, I wondered just before the kickoff against Spurs, whether we would get three points when I looked at the defenders available to us and not knowing how we was going to play those defenders. And it turned out to be a masterclass in the way to play against Spurs, who get a lot of plaudits for being on the front foot, but are also suicidal with the, the high line. And you won't get that sort of green grass behind the back four uh, at Palace that we got against Spurs. But we have players capable of worrying them. You know, I've talked at great length about their two top players. And they are top players. And they haven't been available together all season. And they will leave in the summer. But they're going to look at, at, at Shaw and his ability to drop a ball on a tanner from 60 yards. They're going to look at Bruno. They're going to look at our front three. And they're going to think, this is a test. And it is a test. So as Uncle Joe would say, let them worry about us. 
Yeah, one hundred percent agree with you. Uh, just before I get your result prediction, then John, just give me your verdict on the news that Joe Willick will be out for the season, and then we'll speak about Lewis Smiley as well briefly. But on Joe Willick, it's the right decision, isn't it? You know, we've seen him yeah. come back from a long term injury; it hasn't worked out for him. He's going to have a rest. He's not going to have an operation on the Achilles. Uh, injury that he's got. It's just about getting him ready for next season. I'll read the quote out to you first, John, and then I'll get your take on it. So this is what Eddie Howe had to say on Joe Willick this morning. We have decided that a period where he strengthens the area around his Achilles will benefit him more. The long-term view was taken. We will get him ready for next season. Surgery wouldn't be beneficial for him in this situation. It is frustrating for Joe, but hopefully we can get to the situation where he is playing freely next season. What do you make of that? Uh, it's the right decision. We've we've seen where mid-season players have had to be rushed back, for the want of another word, because we were in such a mess and numbers were so small and players come back and we didn't recognise them. We didn't recognise them. The biggest exam example is Sven Botman, of course. I mean, Botman, an absolutely outstanding defender. And when he come back from injury, you look at him and you, if if you were viewing Botman for the first time in his, in his life, when he come back from injury, you would say, very iffy, one-paced, unsure of himself, etc. You wouldn't dream of buying him. Wasn't anything like the bloke we bought because we rushed him back too soon. Willick's come back from his injury. We got a glimpse in one of the first games of the old Joe Willock we knew, but he's looked nothing like the Joe Willock we know this season. Nothing like it, and he's got to, he's got to get himself right. There's no need now that Anderson's back. There's no need to push him, push him for the last couple of games of the season. Uh, we may get Joe Linton back for a couple to help the midfield rather than uh, rather than Willock. In my leads gone beyond up and beyond what he should this season and he's had more games than he would have ever dreamt possible in his first season because of circumstances he shouldn't be rushed we have seen players rushed and it hasn't helped any of them and we that is absolutely the right decision it's going to be interesting next season and this is for another time when you look at the midfield because Joe Linton's going to come back Wilk's going to come back uh, Tonali is going to come back with Bruno and 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 with Longstaff. So there's going to be a, a few decisions to be made in midfield, and perhaps one bloke can be sacrificed in midfield if somebody has to 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 make money. I mean, it, it, will it be Wilson? Will it be Almiron? Will it be Sean Longstaff? Somebody could be sacrificed because you're going to have a lot of people available pre-season and they were talking about buying a number six a defensive midfield midfield there and they're getting um, links still with midfielders it's going to be interesting but for joe willock to have any sort of chance he's got to be given a rest because it just has not worked for the guy and and he's almost done his own reputation damage as to a certain extent sean longstaff did playing with injuries and well done him for doing that on behalf of the club but it hasn't done him personally any favours and so it's right to rest him we can go with what we've got now and maybe Miggy makes the bench before the end of the season maybe Joe Linton becomes available maybe Trippier does maybe Pope gets a, a game goal before the end of the season but none of those should be rushed because we've seen what rushing a player does it it means the bloke is only 50% of what he really is and eventually collapses again. Yeah. Yeah. So we wish uh, Joe Willick and Lewis Miley the uh, speediest of recoveries and we look forward to seeing them next season. All that remains to be done then, John, is to get your result prediction. How is this one going to go? Yeah. It's going to be interesting because they've got their tails up with the last two results they've had. They are at home. And as I say, as I and Lisa are back together, and they've really been that this season. They are a genuine threat. They're quality players. 
such quality that I don't think Palace will be able to hang on to them. But we've got quality players, and I prefer to remember our quality players. We are in form. We've got 10 points out the last 12. Our last match we played were absolutely dismantled a team that was fourth top of the Premier League and on that day, Tottenham. Um, and Crystal Palace are not to be feared. Don't put fear in our minds when there's no need for it to be there. Don't make ourselves scared of our own shadow. We are a better side than them. Let us show it on the day and let us get the job done. We've got forward players who will really worry them whether they're at home or not. I'm taking us to win. It doesn't matter what the score is because all that matters is you have one more goal than them. And I think we will win. I've got us down for a draw. And that was after speaking to the Crystal Palace podcast. And again, you can see that episode here, that episode on Wednesday morning. When I did the predictor last week, John, I did have Newcastle down for a win. So this is me pretty much saying I'm sitting on the fence. Do I stick with my prediction? I mean, this this episode's going out before the view from the opposition. So if I say we're a win here and then people hear me tomorrow saying a draw, they'll be thinking I've I've totally done a U-turn. I'm going to go for a draw. I think I think Palace have found a good little bit of form. Newcastle have got more than enough to beat them. But I do think there'll be goals in it. So I'm going to go for a draw. I'm going to hope for a win. But I'm going to take a point uh, as the bare minimum. And we'll, well see. I like that because you've been a little bit cautious recently, Andrew, and it's brought results. Because we've actually gone on and won games, 10 points out of 12. And I can understand why you're cautious. Now, I could make out a case for a draw. But honestly... Shy Ben's getting out. Come on, we've got to Newcastle in the dressing room. Look at our front three. Look at Bruno. Look at Shaw. Look at what Anderson can do. Never mind about them. Get out there. Get the job done. It can be done. Go out. And I'm not talking about you here. I'm talking about the players, Andrew. Go out thinking it was a good result and you lose by a single goal because you're just unlucky not to keep the draw there. Go out for a win and you either win or you get a draw. But we have got to be positive. We have had a strength-sapping season, a yo-yo up-and-down season, injuries all over the shop, wonderful highs, 4-1 PSG, terrible lows. But now the boat is steady and it's in calm waters, 10 points out of 12. Just keep rowing in the same direction. Keep going. And before you know where we are, we're one game off the end of the season and we've got you. And believe you me, with the injuries we've had this season, if we finish in the top six and make Europe, we've done well under the circumstances presented to us. Yeah, no arguments there whatsoever, John. Thank you, as always for providing the match preview. Newcastle travel to Selhurst Park on Wednesday to face Crystal Palace. You can catch up with that game. You can follow that game on our website, chroniclelive.co.uk, through our dedicated match day live blog. You can go onto our website right now and find out everything Eddie Howe had to say in the build-up to this game. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, give the video a thumbs up, click subscribe to the channel, and if you're on our podcast channel, Thank you, as always, for tuning in. Leave us a rating and review. And for myself and John, you lucky people, we'll see us again in just two days' time. We'll catch you.